Hello and welcome to my channel. I am Crystal Ann Compton and I am excited to be with you today. I have a great interview with Nicole Evangelique Kerr. Nicole is a near death experiencer. When she was 19 years old, she was involved in a drunk driving car accident and well, she died and then she came back and she's got a story to tell. Now, I just, I love watching videos of people who've had NDEs or people who have crossed over and come back. I've also had my own experience, which I do share in this video, but we just have a fascinating conversation about her primary takeaways, like what she learned as a result of the near-death experience that she had, and also how she was able to kind of get over her childhood and early adult programming that kept her in the trauma that she experienced in that accident for many years afterwards. In fact, it wasn't until about 20 years after the accident that she fully remembered what happened when she passed away. So this is a really cool interview. I think you're going to love it. Uh, before we get into it, just want to remind you, make sure to connect with me via my text community. I tell my text community everything. They know where I'm at, what I'm doing. If you want to be a part of that, it's free. If you're in the States, just go to textcac.com. Also make sure you're connected with my website, crystallancompton.com, because whatever I'm doing, whatever's happening next, it's always going to be on my site. Okay, everybody, without further ado, let's get into today's interview with Nicole Evangelique Kerr. Nicole Angelique Kerr is an award-winning health expert, a disabled Air Force veteran, and a near-death experiencer. She is also the author of You Are Deathless and the co-author of Eating the Rainbow, Lifelong Nutritional Wellness Without Lies, Hype, or calculus. Nicole has seen what awaits at the end of this life because after a near-death experience at the age of 19, she can confidently say that she's been there. Her story helps us and assures us that death is just a new beginning and it's more beautiful than, than we can even begin to comprehend. Nicole, welcome to the Life Magnetics Podcast. I'm so excited that you're here. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. You know, I'm just fascinated with near-death experiences and I'm always like watching them on YouTube and I'm subscribed to a couple of different ones. And it's so interesting to hear everybody's different experience, but also the commonalities, the things that come through over and over and over again. Um, and so I, I definitely want to get into your experience, but I want to start with who you were at the time that it happened because you were so young, um, did you have any kind of a structure of faith or religious or a belief system? Like who were you when this happened to you? Where were you in life? Well, at age 19, I was a people pleaser. I was a God pleaser. And so I was on the path of pleasing my father. That's how I ended up at the Air Force Academy. Uh, I, growing up, you would have never thought me and the military go together. I modeled, I was in junior achievement. I did writing. I did all that kind of stuff. Nothing that didn't study airplanes or anything like that. But I decided to go or apply because women had just been admitted to the academies in 1976 and the first group graduated in uh, 1980. So my class was a class of 86, which is uh, one of the first classes. And so um, I didn't think, I really didn't think I was going to get in. I just thought, okay, I'll go through this. It's a lot of work. You have to have a congressional nomination. I mean, it is heavy duty vetting to get into any of the service academies. And then when I got told that I was accepted, I was like, oh shit, I got to go now. <laughs> you know, I, ca I can't back out of this, you know? And so um, I was like Private Benjamin in a lot of ways, you know, I'm just, I'm 5'11", I'm all legs. They didn't have a uniform to fit me. They had to give me men's pants and women's tops, which they button reverse. So when they have something called a gig line <laughs> in the military and it would never line up and I'd always get demerits, but I could never explain that to people, you know, because it's like, I got men's pants on, you know, um, but anyway, uh, I didn't realize, I realized about three weeks into boot camp that my soul was like, you got to get out of here. And it was really, really an abusive environment for me. You're being 
yelled at, especially as a freshman in any of these places. Um, you're being, you know, emotionally abused, you're being physically abused. And for women, most of us were being sexually abused. If, if it wasn't just sexually, it was being called, you know, all, all kinds of um terrible things. And so it it was really hard to, to not be able to fight back because you're not allowed to say anything. You're It's yes, sir, no, sir, no excuse, sir. Those are the three things you can say. So I was, um, I made it through that first year by the grace of God. I don't know how I did it, but I did. And then starting my sophomore year, I was getting, I didn't have as much um, abuse thrown on me, but the stakes were getting higher academically and the responsibility of what I did. And your day is booked like hour to hour to hour in these academies. You don't get free time. You don't get, quote, fun time unless it's the weekend and you happen to get that off. So the beginning of the sophomore year um, is when the accident happened. Now, I grew up in Mississippi in the Bible Belt extremely religious down there. And uh, my dad was Southern Baptist. My mother was Lutheran. So I got a double dose of religion uh, throughout my whole life. So, you know, the one thing I guess I really, when I think about church now that I didn't like is there was so much of it. We'd go three hours in the morning and then we'd have to go to training union and the church service in the evening at the Baptist church. Then we'd have to do Bible drill. Then we'd have to do uh, Royal ambassadors uh, at Wednesday. And then it was revival time and we had to pack a pew. And here you have these two religions. And for those of you who don't know, Lutheran is more aligned with Catholic. Southern Baptist is just straight on hellfire and brimstone. And here are the rules. And if you don't follow them, you are going to hell, girlfriend. Is we called it H E double uh, hockey sticks. So, because uh, <laughs> you're not supposed to say it out loud, but it was really uh, disciplined. It was really controlling. It was um, uh, this. Each church was this is the way to God, and what I started realizing was even God was probably confused about what everybody was saying was, this is the way to God, you know, um, because I'm like, okay, the Baptists don't want you dancing, but the Lutherans say it's okay to dance, but the Lutherans baptize you as an infant and the Baptists wait till you're older and they put on this show and they dunk you in the water. And that was the most entertaining part of church in the Baptist church. Let me tell you, it was the dunking part. Um, the Baptists know how to have more fun. They have more money. They have more resources. They have more people in their churches. They have gymnasiums. They have roller rinks. They they pulled in. I mean, we had a minister of recreation. He was awesome. But that's what got the kids into the program was all these um, extracurricular activities uh, that made it fun because it was not fun to sit there and listen to a preacher tell you if you don't do this or if you even think this, that you're a bad person and you're not going to go to heaven and that hell is down there burning up and, you know, you're going to be down there. And I just as kids, you go, what, you know, or do you eat barbecue every night? I mean, it was really confusing. So that's how I grew up. And so uh, the concept when I went over to the Air Force Academy, uh, I started praying harder and harder because I was like doing stuff. I was like doing, a, you know, the assault course the, uh, with a bayonet. I was doing a confidence course. I was doing an obstacle course. These are things I had never done. And I was just praying to get through them. And it was like, I just... I, I just wanted to find a way out is what I did. I, you know, it's like, I don't, th this is not fun. It is stressful to me. Uh, anybody can come in your door at any minute and, and mandate you to do anything, push ups, sit ups, whatever it is. And, um, and I just lived in fear. My amygdala was on full throttle the entire year. Um, that's not good for anybody uh, to, to have that happen. And so uh, I think, you know, I'd go to the chapel, which if anybody's been to Colorado Springs, uh, mm -hmm. the Air Force Academy has the most beautiful chapel. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Ar architecturally a wonder in the, in the United States. But I would sit in there on Sunday morning because they upperclassmen can't get you if you're in there. And I would just sit there and I would look up at that cross and I would just go, you know, where is God? Where is God? There's no evidence that you're showing up for me in any of this, you know, um, and so I started to just kind of go, you know, I'm going to go have fun. So 
the squadron party that we were at to kick off the school year, um, I had gotten there late, but uh, I was getting ready to leave. Everybody was breaking up and leaving, and I got a ride back with a senior. And normally, you don't get uh, cars until your juniors or seniors. That's a privilege. So I got a ride back. I asked, hey, can I get a ride back with you? And he's like, sure. And he's like, we're going to stop at this bar and have a couple more beers. And I'm like, well, that sounds cool. And uh, so I had two beers. That's the first alcohol I would had of the day. I smoked a cigarette first time. And uh, the I remember the the bartender asking him, are you okay to drive? And he said, yeah. And so we get back in his shiny red 1965 Corvette convertible. Ooh. And now he wants to stop at the Rocky Mountains and uh, just look at the scenery. Now I am so naive. I never went on a date in high school. Okay. Never. And now I'm in a school with 4,000 guys. And my dad tells me not to date upperclassmen, no smoking and drinking. Those are his rules. Okay. <laughs> Along with God's rules, those are his. And I'm like, okay, I'm a, I'm a sophomore now I can have a little bit of fun. And so, uh, I said, okay, but we got to get back, you know, to the academy by 735 or we're going to get in trouble. And I just don't want to start out the new year in trouble because I, I last year got in trouble by doing honest things for other people that they knew had uh, a penalty if you got called. And sure enough, I got called, you know, so I was marching tours. I was doing all this stuff for doing other people favors, you know, uh, and I thought mm -mm, not doing it this year. So anyway, I said, I was worried about that. And so he was trying to make a pass at me. And I was like, no, we got to get back on the road. So on the road, we went. And the next thing I remember, I woke up in the ICU at Penrose Community Hospital. The only thing I remembered out of that entire experience were bright white lights. Okay. Now, Raymond Moody, who coined the term near death experience, he's probably the, the grandfather of the whole movement. He said the most common element in ND years is that bright, white, clear light. It's not like a headlight or a camera flash that kind of blinds you. It's clear. You can see it and it doesn't cause that want to, you know, back off reflection. So um, that's all I remembered. And I remember asking the, my surgeon, you know, could that have been the operating room lights that I was seeing? And she goes, no, Nicole, you were unconscious. They, I was declared dead at the scene. Okay. And I didn't wake up until the next morning. It happened at 7 35 at night. So we weren't going to make it back to the Academy. And, uh, so he lied to me about that. Okay. And the other thing was his dad wore three stars and headed the army Corps of engineers in Washington. So he made one phone call to the superintendent of the Academy. And this is where rank has its privilege and it's not a fair, nothing is fair, you know, um, not nothing, but a lot of things are not fair. And he allowed, uh, this guy to graduate where any other cadet would have been kicked out immediately. So there was that piece of injustice there that just never, uh, I, that's why law and order is like my favorite show. It's like, get them. <laughs> you know, I, want the, right. I want the justice done. So, um, I spent four months in the hospital. I, uh, thank my EMT, John Hartling. He's one of my angels in the book, uh, You Are Deathless. I talk, I have a whole chapter about the uh, four angels, okay? And they are my surgeon. She was the first female surgeon in Colorado Springs. She was the first female medical student at Jefferson College in Philadelphia. She's a maverick. And so, she was in charge of my care. She was on call that night. Uh, that's when doctors still had pagers and, you know, were, were called to the scene or called to the hospital. Um, my, the paramedic, the EMT, he was former Navy, hard ass guy. He got to the scene. They covered me up with a blanket and said, she's dead. And he said, nobody tells me what to do. Or if someone's dead, I check them out myself. Thank God. Because when he did my right pupil, uh, flickered and dilated. Now, what do we know about eyes and spirituality? Windows to the soul. Exactly. <laughs> when he saw that, my soul flew back in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Up until that point, I was dead. But that's 
where my soul came back in and they got me going again. My blood pressure was 60 over zero. I had cut off my foot. I mean, you can read about the accident in the, in the, um, in the book. I detail it quite extensively. It's the first chapter and I'm willing to give it to people for free. If you just go on my website and ask for it, then you get an idea of what I went through. But, um, I, I had so many injuries and the good thing was, is I didn't have a head injury other than a bad road burn from skidding on the pavement. It shaved off a couple of layers of skin and my spine was intact, but man, did I cut up everything around it. So, um, they were just trying to, to, um, resuscitate me that night and keep me going. And, and they did, you know, um, or I, I did, I don't know, something intervened where I came back and was able to stay alive. Uh, so I was in the hospital that whole time and it was like this, I would start getting better. And then psh, I had a code blue during an emergency operation. They told my parents she's gone. Uh, they even called the time on the operating room, you know, it was like, and then boom, here comes my heart again. And uh, I have a military angel with me called James. And that angel fought so hard. Thank you, James, <laughs> to keep me alive. And then there was a third near death experience that I had in the hospital where my lungs filled up with fluid and they would use a needle like this big, no kidding, uh, to drain them. And it kept filling up. They kept draining it with the needle. And um, then finally, Dr. Stewart just said, you know, we can't keep doing this. This isn't working. I'm going to give her a diuretic. She's overloaded on fluid. They gave me the diuretic. I peed off three quarts of fluid and wow. that saved me. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I could feel myself suffocating and it was a horrible feeling. And I was just like, Oh my God, I thought they were turning off my oxygen. That's what it felt like to me, but it was really me just, you know, the fluid just overloading and suffocating. And so even to this day, I will, I will not um, dive. Uh, I'll scuba, I'll stay on the surface <laughs> where I can keep, keep going with my head up and down. My husband loves to dive. I'm like, you go for it. I'll watch uh, Jacques Cousteau and National Geographic <laughs> to get those images. But um yeah, that's a real fear I have now, you know, of, mm -hmm. of just not getting enough air because I was on a ventilator for a long time. Wow. So lots of trauma, lots of trauma. And yeah. then when I was released, um, the doctor said to my mother, you know, uh, Nicole's going to need some mental health. I, you know, I really want you to get her started on that when you guys get home. And uh, she needs a psychologist and a psychiatrist. And mom said to the doctor, uh, Jesus and God are our psychologist and psychologist and we'll be just fine. And, you know, Crystal Ann, <laughs> it's yeah. wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus and God don't come down and sit, sit with you and start asking you these questions of how do you feel about this or whatever the process that you need to go through is to heal. And mind pain turned into an eating disorder. And I didn't know back mm -hmm. in the early 80s what binge eating is what it's now called, but back then it was called compulsive eating um, because I got better physically, but I didn't have any support mentally. And I didn't have, I was thrown right back into my parents' uh, Baptist and Lutheran uh, religious uh, context right. back in that church. Okay. So God saved me for a reason. That was it. And I needed to uh, basically give myself to the Lord and be his servant for saving me. There's a reason why he saved me. So that was what my parents were telling me. And I should be grateful and I should be out there preaching and blah, blah, blah. So um, I went back to school uh, my, where my sister was at Southern Methodist University. Okay. What do you know about SMU? Not nothing, not much. <laughs> okay. Very sorority in it, very okay. fraternity in it, uh, very into looks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Eating disorders. Uh oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's where that came in too, because I had a mangled body and every girl there was, you know, had their XU 
horseshoe on their little short shorts or whatever. And I just, my self-esteem just nosedived in record time. And it was a very, very difficult time because my sister didn't get a sister or a roommate. She got somebody who was ill and didn't know what it was and how to treat it. And she was trying to go out and have fun and live her life and date and all that. So um, it was really, uh, I wasn't ready to get into that uh, life, but because I could walk again and because I could function physically, my dad thought that it was time. It had been a year for me to go, you know, live with my sister and quit having my mother be so, and I, her and I become so codependent with each other. That was huge for me because I reverted back to infancy at 19 and I missed that whole stage of individuating again. And so my mother took care of me every day in that hospital and I put her as one of the angels and then she left me and the relationship was never the same. And so her and my dad are now religious addicts. I don't speak to either one of them. It is so sad for me, but they um, don't see God the same way I see God after my experience. They don't believe in NDEs. They, uh, you know, um, it, it's just... It's sad when somebody is religiously addicted, you never can win an argument because God is the ultimate authority. Right. And God, if he tells you this, then it is so. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so there's a lot to unpack here. I, I, um, I, and that's not even when that's not even when the memory came back. The memory came back 19 years later. Okay, because I was wondering because so you're at the yeah. time you're remembering white lights, that's and they're it. saying you know that's it wasn't the the operating room or anything like that. Um, did you have a sense though deep down, even though your mom's telling you we, you don't need a therapist, you know you it's go back to God, become a preacher. Did you have a sense deep down then that something had happened? something yes, profound. Okay. But I stuffed it so far down into my little toe that it took me 20 years for my body to feel safe enough to even remember it. And, okay. um, and so that happened when I was working at the centers for disease control in Atlanta, because I just went on with life. Uh, like I'm supposed to, I go to college, I get a degree. I went into nutrition to try to figure out why I had an eating disorder. Um, and then I realized it wasn't the food. It was, mm -hmm. it, it was, you know, pain and mental illness basically. Um, but now I can tell you everything you want to know about food, but I'm, I'm getting out of that business and going into the spiritual because the food was always just a symptom of the pain. And yes. I just could never get at the pain and I didn't know, how, and nobody could recognize it. And it's such a shame-based disorder. And I think every woman that grows up in America is faced with some type of body disorder or eating yes. disorder at some point in their life. Many resolve it, but a lot don't and carry it through, you know, into their 50s, 60s, when their kids yes. empty nest, and then it starts manifesting in a different way. They start drinking a lot of wine or whatever mm -hmm. it is to, to escape that. So um, that's a really cultural stamp on a lot of us that is so hard to unwind. Okay, yes. Um, so I want to share with you, because when I was 20 six, I think I was 26 when was I 28 when I gave birth to my daughter, I contracted a postpartum septic infection. Um, and I was taken to the hospital at Northwestern in Chicago. And they said, she's fine. You know, she's, they ran their numbers, um, but I wasn't fine. Something was very wrong with me. And I think about a week later, just continued to decline. The infection started to go septic. And I went back to the doctor. And by then I was very near death. I, I remember them wheeling me in a wheelchair in the snow on the streets of Chicago to Northwestern because they couldn't get a taxi fast enough to go there a couple of blocks. Um, and that night, mm -hmm. I don't, I can't say that I died because I, I, no one ever told me that, but I can't, I remember being wheeled into the OR. I remember my doctor who also treated Maggie Daly. He was such a cool, cool doctor, but I remember him leaning over and saying, okay, we don't know what's going to happen at the end of this surgery but you're probably going to be wearing a bag um, because I was having terrible pain here. You're probably going to be wearing a bag. Things are going to be different, but we'll deal with it when we get there. I remember getting wheeled into OR and looking up and seeing this tall man, beautiful, blonde, angelic looking man. 
at least he, you know heads and shoulders above everyone else there but if i were to guess like six nine to seven like huge guy in scrubs yeah. at the corner of the room just looking at me getting wheeled wheeled in and i had the feeling like wow that doesn't look like a human being man he's just so beautiful and then i went into surgery that night and i did have an experience now it wasn't it wasn't uh like the near-death experiences i watch on youtube because mine was actually a little scary um and in my experience, I was being wheeled through the hospital halls. We make a turn and I go down this long, long hallway. It, it's, it's, um, it, it, it ends up being a train station and I'm about to board a train. And on my right, I'm seeing like my first husband, family members. And then I see other friends and family kind of on the side, uh, on the side as I'm being wheeled by. I get to a turnstile and I get up out of my wheelchair <laughs> and I try to go through the turnstile and I look up and there's this huge being that would look that I would describe as like the Grim Reaper. Like I had a hood, had a scythe and his face was a clock. And it was, I, I don't remember what time it was. I was just like, whoa. And he took yeah. his scythe and he tapped my medical band and he was, his clock went like that. And then that was the last, bit of my experience. I remember when I woke up, I told people that I had this terrible experience. My brother-in-law was a pharmacist and we had doctors in the family and they're like, oh, it was probably the narcotics, probably the meds, probably had a bad dream. I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know because in retrospect um, and the following year after that, and I share all of this because I kind of want to get to this with you. I developed an eating disorder as well. I come from a long history of trauma. This was kind of the catalyst moment for me. Um, and the year that followed that traumatic physical event, I dealt with so much fear. Now I had this little baby. How, I can't leave her. I got to get better. I developed crippling OCD. I developed terrible bulimia and anorexia. And I still deal with the narratives around eating disorders to this day. Now that doesn't mean I'm practicing, but I still have to always deal with it. And we're talking, I'm 54 now, so many, many years later. So talk, can you talk about, I mean, you're so young when this happens too, and your mom just forces you right back into religion and like, just go to SMU, just be a real girl, you know, like, how do you deal with the fear, the deep down, I know you said you tamped down the experience, but your body's got to process what's just happened to you. How did you manage to overcome the fear of what happened to you, the fear of, of, of the condition that you found yourself in and begin? When did that happen that you began to shift and start to thrive? Okay, so I will tell you, most eating disorders, we do not uh, embody our emotions, okay? Uh, you're cut off right here. You can think and you can intellectualize what the emotions should be. So I should be mad at the guy that was driving, but I instead was blamed because I broke my father's rules. Well, that doesn't make sense to me, but he's my father and he said, flat out said that to me. And then, you know, my heavenly father, is basically a mirror image of my earthly father. And so I've now made, uh, you know, I did this, uh, God now blames me. And so what I had to do was I had to start finding my way out from under those churches. So I began to go to different churches thinking, let me see what unity has to offer or this one or that one. And I got more into metaphysical with Louise Hay and Wade Dyer and Doreen Virtue and all of those uh, um, authors. And um, what, what age were you when you started looking into that? Probably uh, like 20s. Okay. Okay. And uh, still my eating disorder went on for 20 years. It wasn't until I got married that I really resolved it. And I think the other thing that I did was I did a soul retrieval because when that car crash happened, parts of my soul left me. Okay. My entire soul left when I went up in the air. Okay. And that's when this being I call in the book, Casper the ghost came and kind of lifted me up. Just the end of August, I found out that was my grandfather. And he came in that form, an angel type form. And he was the one that retrieved me. 
Now I find this weird because my grandfather died at 58 and uh, I'm 58 and he died at the end of August. And that's when I was, when this, just this vision came to me that that's who, um, that's who, who picked me up and brought me up. And we went up and I was like, oh, it's so beautiful up here because we went in this, this white light that was just cocooning us. And, um, and to me, when you think about white light, all other colors are absorbed by white, right? So when I was on the other side, I saw colors that don't belong. I mean, there were more colors than in the Crayola color box. Now, I don't know what they're up to now, 100 colors or whatever. But uh, let me tell you, there's so many colors out there that we have no idea even exist. And music, you know, and it's just like this you're in all of that and you're like a chrysalis in this cocoon and it's safe and there's no uh the love is beyond love I think that we can even understand um you I, I believe we all come here on a journey to learn to love and it's about our soul's expansion but that love is like nothing I think humans always seem to manage to put a condition around love. I, I, I don't care who you are. It just seems to happen. Um, I will love you as long as you do X, Y, Z. And so for me, I became a perfectionist. I tried to, to do every, to be a pe people pleaser. I took on that identity to another degree and tried to please my dad and mom, hoping that they would forgive me and take me, quote, back in. But that never happened. And um, so I would say, you know, I started the search going to 12 step programs to start dealing with the compulsive eating that said uh, uh, the first uh, step was turning your power over to a higher spirit. And I I'd never even heard that term before. And my parents thought I was in some kind of cult with with, uh, you know, 12 step programs because they just couldn't <laughs> understand them. And so I just. I had to start finding my way, you know, and then somebody said, have you, you, you need to get into therapy, Nicole, you know? And so I, I tried a therapist and then I tried body work and I tried, I want you to know by the age I am now, I have been there, done that and tried everything available Eastern and Western to deal with migraines, to deal with just my physical uh, situation. You know, I was always looking for something external to fix me or, or to take the pain away. And what I never really wanted to do was to realize the toxicity and the narcissism uh, coming from my parents mm -hmm. uh, toward me and being told as a kid that family is everything. And that, you know, and here we are in the holiday season and everything's about family. And it, it's always, a, it's a hard time for people or it's a glorious time for people, you know, but it is not the image that we're led to believe. And it was very, very difficult for me to have to let them go. But the truth is they let me go back at 18 when my dad actually said the Air Force Academy would make you a, a, a woman few would rival. Knowing since he went there about the abuse that went on, my mother didn't stop him. None of my sisters or brothers even questioned, why are you doing this, Nicole? You, you know, good Lord, girl, they're going to make you go into a boot camp and you're going into a POW survivor. I mean, this is not play stuff. This is actual, you are trained to kill people. And I'm thinking, shit, you know, mm -hmm. what have I done? You know, but there, I, I would feel like a total failure if I quit. And I just could not, the shame of quitting, I, I'd rather have died. And that's basically what happened is I just could not go on. Mm -hmm. Um, there anymore it was just too much for me and, and I think soul loss is a huge thing um that a lot of people don't know about and yeah, yeah talk to talk to us you said when this happened you think you lost parts of your soul what do you mean by that well when I had seen a shaman in 2019 I knew I was doing everything to get well and I still didn't feel well I was still dealing with depression and PTSD and um you know still uh just not feeling good, fatigue, just blah, really. Sure. And um, 
and there's some questions you can ask yourself if you know if you've had soul loss. And the first is, I didn't want to be here. I knew on the other side, when I looked down at myself, I could see myself in the ditch dead. Uh, I didn't want to get back in that body because there was going to be a lot of pain and there was going to be a lot of suffering. And I just did not want to go through my life dealing with that. But I was told that I was going to go back and my message was going to be to tell people not to be afraid of death. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Do you know how big that message is? And I'm like, I don't, I don't want to go back, you know? So some people are given the choice if they want to stay or go. Right. Um, I, I wasn't given the choice. I was told I was going to go back. So I believe I renegotiated a contract at that point to come back and it's taken me 40 years. Now I, that is like the time it took what the Israelites wandering around in the wilderness, you know, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that's what I feel like. Cause it took me almost 20 years for my memory to come back of the crash. And then another 20 to start really aligning my mind, my soul, my spirit, and my body to embody the emotions, to understand what that means, to have a relationship with my soul. What does that even look like? All I knew growing up in the South was soul food and soul music and oh, your soul would go to hell, whatever that was, you know, but you, it's a hard concept to, to really verbalize, especially to children. Um, so I didn't want to be here. And I think that's the first thing is if somebody really feels like they don't, they don't want to be here. You know? so, the so second if, thing, okay. So you're saying if somebody feels like they don't want to be here, is that indicative of them having experienced some soul loss? Or like, what is that point? It's, to? Is it's that one of it's. It, it, it can be. There's okay. some, you know, like a box of criteria. Mm -hmm. You have two or three out of these. It could, it could potentially be that. Okay. Do you have a low? Do you have a low level, um, consistent feeling that something is missing? Okay. Okay. Um, and it's interesting to know that many compulsive behaviors. Uh, and addictions fall into that statement. And I can clearly see now the link between my compulsive eating and my feeling of loneliness and emptiness. And I just can't. And then the third one is I can't get over it. You know, it's just like I was dealing with chronic wasting and anorexic for years. And um, it, it just you know, I was stuck at a certain weight. It was not a healthy weight, no matter what I was doing. It wasn't, I wasn't um, absorbing nutrition. And here I am a dietitian. I was actually malnourished, malnourished in the sense of love, my needs, uh, that all of that, I wasn't getting it from anybody. And I had given up on God at that point too, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, I'm still a little confused though with what soul loss is. Like, what does that actually it's mean? It's fragments. It's fragments that of your soul that leave you, okay. um, because it's a means of your soul self protecting itself. Okay, I get it. So this makes sense to me. Like during acute traumas as a child, super super terrible trauma. I believe I left fragments of myself in, in that timeline. There's fragments of me yes. still there. So this is what you yes. mean by that. Okay, got it, got it, yes. got it. All right. Okay. okay. Thank you for putting it in a simpler. Oh no no no! You're way. welcome. I just wanted but, to make sure. Yeah. But it's but it really is. I, I the shaman I worked with was in Hawaii and he said he'd never seen anything like mine, which was about a thirty degree. Uh, split. And so I'm walking around this earth exposed that much. And he said, no wonder, because you're not, your soul has not come back together. Got so it. you need to pull those fragments back in that fled to have your soul, um, reintegrated. And yeah. You, you reintegrated. That's the word. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you can start having a relationship with it. You know, what does my soul want to tell me today? Lee Harris asks that, you know, starts out his lectures with that, you know, and um, it's like, it's a great question to write at the top of your, your journal. You know, what does my soul want to tell me today? And at first you may hear nothing. And then you keep asking and you'll start dialoguing with it. And you'll be amazed at what you'll get in terms of information. So, um, you know, I had wished that I had known earlier about something called soul loss in, like you said, um, trauma and sexual abuse and things like that, because that's how you just 
you just completely shut down, you know, and you can't operate like a normal person when you've got parts mm -hmm. of you missing. Right. And it kind of makes me wonder like these, um, I know this is a little weird thought, but these, these hauntings that you hear about where something happens every night at 10 o'clock, the woman walks down the hall and turns the corner. Um, if that's like a little bit of the residual energy that she left behind right before some sort of a big traumatic event when she was alive. Yeah. And it's not to say she hasn't crossed and gone on, but that's still here. And you see those civil yeah. war soldiers going up into the trees at the same time, five in the evening, every night they're marching on. So part of them is still here. And so that makes a lot of sense to me. Like, and I think we, we should really start thinking about that. W what have you left a, a behind in your timeline? And how can you call it back into form into yourself? Now, is this the work that the shaman did, or did, is this something that you were able yes. to learn how to do yourself? No, okay. he he did it. I took um, an intro to shamanism class just so I could get a better understanding of what shamanism is. Uh, and I'm glad I did. Um, I don't want to go down that road and be one. Uh, it, it, it is you have to really put up a lot of protection around yourself. Let's just say that as a, as a practitioner, but um, it's a powerful healing tool that works. And what you're dealing with here is the spiritual and hidden realm. And it's a very real thing. Mm -hmm. So, and then the other oh, message, okay. There's, there's two messages and I want to make sure I get the other one in. Okay. I, was not in physical form when I went to the other side. Okay. So I'm hearing, and I don't know how I'm understanding this conversation between two spirits next to me. I don't know if they're speaking English or what language or whatever, but from my soul perspective, I understood them perfectly. So they were having a discussion about how these earth beings need to ask for help. And that means that if we want help from the angelic realm, we have to ask for it. They're not going to just fly in and help us unless it's an emergency like mine was. Okay. Then they'll zoom in. But on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis, you have to ask for help. And I know people think it's crazy to ask your angels for help with a parking space, but, but it happens and people do it and they get parking spaces. Yep. You know, it, it, it's not about it being too little or too big or not worthy of asking them or whatever. It is they are there to help us. But we have something called free will. OK, and they're not going to intervene because we have that free will. So we have to learn to ask. And so many of us forget to ask. We get on with our routine and our life seems to be going well. And it's not until we get into a crisis that we ask for help, you know? So start trying to dialogue. We all have guardian angels. Every single one of us is given a guardian angel. So um, try to start uh, understanding that, what that relationship looks like you know, mm -hmm. and start asking questions. Um, and you'll be surprised what you'll find out, but we need to start awakening to who we are, to the beings that we were born to be, and the spiritual amnesia that we've been in, this fog that has been all these filters, whether it's been through religion or authoritarian figures or uh, whatever it is, it's about this time, it's kind of like in Hawaii, um, Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa, uh, they just had uh, Pele just erupted, mm -hmm, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, it, and it's kind of like, okay, people, wake up. COVID was another wake up, people. And we didn't do a very good job. You know, I'm my background is public health as well. And being an epidemiologist, you look at the data and it was going, now this is coming animal to human transmission, just like swine flu and all these other ones. What are we doing with the animals? The first groups that got it were the poultry industry workers mm -hmm. and the cattle beef industry workers. Did we change the way that we uh, process uh, meat? I'm not saying you need to be vegan. I'm just saying it was an opportunity to look at this and how we transmit things and do something different about it. And we didn't. No, we did not. <laughs> so... Um, that's the kind of thing that I think we get these, we get these opportunities to recognize things and do something about it. And then 
it's almost like in everything in our life, we have to wait till something critical happens. And then we mm -hmm. can go, uh Oh, I better do something now. You know, well now, now it's going to be much harder to turn that Titanic around. We can still do it, but we've got to start, um, coming together and realizing, and that's one of the 10 common lessons from NDEs is that everyone and everything is connected. We are all connected because we're all energy. And there's still so many people that don't get that. You know, oh, yeah. your, cough, your cough, your cough is going to connect to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and uh, that's why in public health, we say wear a mask, you know, right, right. Uh, it's, it's not some, oh, I'm not going to even go into all that, okay. but it, it, it's just <laughs> right. like, yeah, I went to school four years and then you're telling me, you know, your opinion is, uh, well, I, no, I don't believe it or whatever. It just, it was so ridiculous on so many levels, but, um, right. anyway. Well I mean, yes, for sure. And I think that um, that that is a very hot button conversation that we could have. But I, <laughs> what I really want to, what I'm really curious about is what awakened the memory because something must have shifted to bring that, let that bubble to the surface. And you had to be of a consciousness where you noticed it and could process it. So what what happened? Why did you remember, do you think? You know, I think there are people, because people ask me, you know, I had something happen and I can't remember and it's been 40 years. Will I ever remember? And the way I look at it today is if your body feels safe enough to deal with the trauma and mm -hmm. it's going to be for the greater good of you and society, I think the body will allow that to come up and be processed. But if you're going to not benefit from it coming up, or it's going to cause more trauma in you, I think it's going to stay protected and stay in your body. And I don't know why it took 19 years, but at that point I had been, been working um, and, and, you know, going to Omega to some of these retreats and starting to look at things in a different way. And I started, you know, understanding more what the eating disorder was about and looking at that. And, um, I don't know. It, it wasn't the caffeine from the Starbucks because it happened. I just walked out normal routine, go to Starbucks, got my coffee, went to work and I could see myself sitting in that Corvette. Exactly. My, my uh, right foot was on the dashboard. My left foot was crossed over. You know how you cross it over and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and then and by the way, audience, don't ever sit that way in a car, please. Okay. They told me that in the ER, that is the worst way to sit or both legs up on the dashboard or one foot hanging out the door. That is the worst injuries happen in car wrecks when your feet are like that. Keep oh, them gosh. flat on the mat. I kick my leg up all the time. Just one leg. My, no. my head. Oh, okay. I'm going to stop doing that. <laughs> kick, kick, kick that back down. Get okay. them both on that mat. Okay. And um, I could see myself. And then I went butt up through the windshield and that that wound up cutting up uh, a huge uh, fourth degree laceration between my anal and sphincter um, cut up the whole vagina area a huge hole um, they had to skin graft that they had to skin graft my foot back together um, and you know I think it was I had sepsis set in they didn't think they thought they were gonna have to amputate my leg from it all the debris and the the infections that were setting in and um, then I got gangrene it was just um, one I'd have a colostomy you know as you were talking earlier mm -hmm. about a bag yeah I woke up with from surgery 19 and the first thing I thought about was no one's gonna want to have sex with me right. you know because I'd never had sex and I just thought I can't stand to look at this, you know? And so that, that pain all had to go somewhere. So yeah. uh, that's where it wound up to me was in the eating disorder and in the need to control things. I really became someone who, oh no, I'm going to drive. Uh, everybody else can drink, but I'm going to drive. Nope. Um, I, you know, I just really wanted to be safe. I would come in by 10 o'clock. I didn't want to stay out past 10. I don't go out on New mm. Year's Eve. I mean, I would do things to try to control whether or not I was going to put myself at risk of ever being in another car crash again. So that's so wild to me that um, you got your coffee and you're, you're <laughs> driving and then all of a sudden you're seeing this happen again. So the memories are coming back, but I want to just make an observation about your statement that the body will and the mind will protect you from previous traumas if they're not useful to you. 
Um, and when they become useful to you, or if you get to a consciousness, or you could say a vibratory state where that trauma can activate, you can remember it, and it becomes useful, meaning you can use it to further heal, or you can share, help others, then it starts to come back online, and you have the resources and the capacity to deal with it. So just on that mundane day, yes. getting your Starbucks, you're just like, okay, but it's time. And here we go. Yeah. Going down that and, rabbit hole. And then I went to see uh, my chiropractor who does body work. And he said, Nicole, these are repressed memories. And he said, they're starting to come up now. And he said, this is very typical in trauma. So he worked with me using acupressure points to help me remember. And I got to the part where I was flew out of the car and I got stuck up in the air because I looked, looked down and I knew I was going to die. And I just was like, oh my God, I, I, this is it. And I can't do anything about it. I can't physically stop myself from dying. And I think that is one of the hardest things for people to get is they can't control their body. They can't uh, make themselves do something um, like that's just going to happen. You're going to, you're going to hit and it's going to happen. And, you know, and you just kind of go, oh my God. Um, and so I think for me, it was, it was such a, like the next day he said, go home, don't go to work, lay down. I slept in my guest room. I wanted um, as little space as possible. You know, I wanted to be really like safe and the rest of the memory did come back. And that was actually going to the other side and having that conversation about um, not to be afraid of death, because you, as you know, fear is such a low vibration. And if you're in fear, you're never going to get clarity. You're always going to be here in your amygdala and making decisions out of here instead of out of your prefrontal cortex, which is where all your executive functioning comes out of. So um, you're going to make poor decisions and you're going to wind up sabotaging yourself over and over again so you've really got to get to the root of these belief systems you know that are going on that are causing you to not live your your fullest life and it's um it's time for us to start doing that and it's starting to open up i think you know and the whole field of energy medicine is coming on board which is, mm -hmm. is fantastic too um but um I think the most important reason we're all here is for our souls to evolve on this journey of love because God is love. I will just tell you that there's no duality. There is no judgmental God or punitive God. He is not a white man in a beard up there waiting for <laughs> you to come with a, a chart. You know, that's, that's more like Santa Claus, you know, it really mm -hmm. is. Um, but to love yourself is the first thing that matters. And that's not just like being kind to yourself. It's actually how you're talking your thoughts to yourself. So if you're saying I should be doing this, I should be doing that, get that should out of your head. Because every time you are saying that you are shaming yourself and sh shame is a low, low vibration. And that runs your energy system in China medicine so you really need to get upshift that and and get that out of your vocabulary and the same thing with try I tell people don't say you're going to try to make the appointment you're either going to make it or you're not because trying is one foot in and one foot out looking for something better there is no try there's only do wasn't that Yoda yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah but I just wanted to say um uh, with regard to the fear of dying, because I think that no matter how religious you are or what your belief system is, I think so many people still have a fear of this. I mean, and, and you wonder, well, before the baby comes out of the womb, his lovely little cushy womb where he's been for nine months, super comfortable, nice and warm, can hear his mom's voice. Is the baby afraid before the baby is born? I don't think so. I mean, how do we know? But the baby just makes the journey. So, but as once we're here though, it's it's not as easy as that. Like we're gonna make this journey, each and every one of us, and it's coming. And I, I talked to my brother recently, um, he's an evangelical Christian, but he's like the best, beautiful, most Christian, like the right kind of Christian, loving person. And he has this belief system and he has for many years, but he's like, you know, I, my biggest fear is like the, the last gasp, that last breath, what is that going to be like? Even though I have faith, I have fear. And I'm like, well, th isn't that interesting? And I guess I would have a little bit of that fear too. So how would you 
help people to get over that last gasp, whatever is going to happen to cause us to transition? Like, how can we feel better about that? I think that's where we have to start the narrative and start changing the narrative about death that we have in this culture today. Uh, almost every book written about death frames it as doom and gloom and negativity and depression um, throughout our culture and society is what it looks like. Whereas other cultures, they'll lay the body out for three days in the home. You walk by it every day, you touch it, you talk to it. Uh, it's not scary, you know, and you even look at Halloween here, how we scare little kids with these images of coffins and Dracula coming out and, mm -hmm. and things like that, you know, so um, we have got to start changing that narrative of death and talking to kids earlier about what death really means. And my own experience, along with hundreds of thousands of other people that have had NDEs, is that death is absolute beauty, light, and loving kindness on the other side. And we're also human. So we can't, you know, I, I would love to magic away the doom and gloom, but we're going to have to get there gradually. And I want everybody at every age. So this means children to understand the cosmic content and just, um, I mean, don't misunderstand me. There's still suffering, there's grief, there's pain, there's loss, all of that. And we have to be careful and compassionately hold and heal. But the cosmic content text, excuse me, context is benevolent and extraordinary. And knowing this true context enables us to live a happier, fulfilling life and to pre prepare for our own graceful passing and to support others as they approach their own transition. And I think the more we talk about this and the more we address the fears, that's the only way you're going to get there is the difficulties in getting to this place to change it is the fear. And that's when my book, I have a checklist in the back of things that you may fear. And one of them is like, you know, I fear the physical pain of dying. You know, I um, fear dying alone. And, and I will tell you, no one dies alone. You know, there is a whole spiritual realm that comes in when you die. Now, yes, you may not be, a human may not be there. And we saw that with COVID. But you're not, got these spiritual beings, they start seeing them. And that's when people are getting closer to making their final transition. And, you know, they're reaching out or they're um, talking and it's not making sense. And people think, oh, but they must be on some kind of drug that they're hallucinating. And they're just going from the other side of the veil back to here. They're transferring and it's confusing. And you're thinking they're, they're, you know, crazy or something, but they're not at all. And so to start approaching this, we have to start talking about it and we have to start talking about it in a positive way that it's going to happen to us. Don't keep putting it off thinking it's not going to happen until you're, you know, 80 or 60 or whatever it is, because it's all part of the life cycle. And the more we're exposed to it, it takes that fear away. And when, when that fear is gone, then we can get in alignment and we can be at peace because if you're resisting fear, if you're resisting death in that last breath, it scares you even more and the fear overrides everything. And so that's what you have to have a knowing and a peace about that you're just transferring to, uh, you know, John Lennon said, I just get in another car. You know, it's mm -hmm. just out one car and in another car, you know, and you just keep going on um, and it's a beautiful journey. And our souls have uh, a long uh, journey. This isn't our first rodeo. To that end, do you believe in something like past lives? Do you think we die and then return? Or do you think when you're talking yes. about a journey, are we going dimensional journeys upward and upward up? What do you think? I think I think we're going into we're in the third dimension right now, going into the fourth and the fifth. I do believe in that in terms of vibration. We're moving up the scale. And I think some more so than others and some <laughs> faster, but things are speeding up and you're having to it's like, whoa, you can't avoid some of this. But I do believe that our souls have um, past lives and they can come 
not from just being on earth. They can come from interplanetary. I mean, I think we would be very small minded to think we're the only uh, people, humans or, or some form of living something or another out in the world. So I think there are other galaxies or planets where they're more compassionate. They respect each other. They respect uh um, animals, uh, all sentient beings and mother earth. And we're not doing a very good job with any of those three, in my opinion, right now, given the knowledge that we have, how we treat other people is still horrific, you know, um, in 2022, which is what we're still seeing, you know? Um, and so I think these people can come and incarnate in earth to try to help raise the, the vibration of earth. Um, but it's hard for them because they're seeing stuff they didn't see in their world, in their planet. And they're like, how can people do this to one another? Or how could they just, you know, put these dogs out here to fight each other, you know, um, mm -hmm. and they think it's fun and, you know, and it's barbaric and it, it, things like that. So, and then there's the whole angelic realm that's right. operating too. You know, I think that, um, I, I, I want to just add to that, that I think that a lot of us are mistaking the uh, Maya, the illusion, the, I feel like so much is being projected to us as if it is real and it is indicative of our nature um, based on what we're seeing in politics, based on what we're seeing with war, based on what we're seeing with, you know, race divisiveness and all these things. We, it's always being projected into us. I think the mistake for us, especially spiritual people, is believing that. Because at the yes. end of the day, I feel yes. like people fundamentally, like you said, we are all connected. And if I am you and you are me and we are we, then that means we have these similarities in common. And I know I'm a good person fundamentally and so are you. And I think that's what's true. And it's about reorienting, like turning those dials all the way down and reorienting yes. to what is eternally true. And that's how we move forward. But if we're going to get lost in the projection, we become the projection, we become the Bork. Now we've been assimilated. Yes. So we gotta yes. be we've got to get conscious. And I do think that's why we have incarnated at this time in Earth's history, because we came to help people get conscious. Absolutely. Uh you and I are both light workers and we're mm -hmm. we're connecting the bridges from the old to the new, you know, and it's gonna be uh I think a lot more people are waking up to that fact that they are a light worker. They're, they're not sure how they fit in, but it's like me, I'm coming into my, this is my vocation now, you know? Yeah. If you want to ask me a question about, uh, uh, you know, fasting or something like a nutrition, I'll be happy to answer it, but that's not where, you know, your physical body is so temporary. And so to spend time developing the, your spiritual side and what that looks like for you and how that how you relate to whatever concept you have of God you know and start asking the questions and start talking to people about this kind of stuff because I mean so many people just check out with football or just I mean right now yeah you can check out all weekend with football <laughs> between <laughs> high school college uh then the big pros you know mm -hmm. but um it's just, it actually becomes magical and fun when you start knowing that you're not alone in terms of creation and that you start asking for things and the evidence does show up when you ask for it and you start working with your soul and your spirit guides and your angels, the things just start lining up for you. And it's just, it's like, awe. you know, you're just going, wow, you know, and you know, you're in the right place. And right. you get signs if you ask for them and you have to be open-minded and willing to look at things differently instead of staying in your, your tunnel vision, you know, just open it up and say, wow, let me just try this or let me see if this works for me, you know, and do I really believe that, you know, uh, Jesus, I'm going to go up there and, you know, uh, God's going to condemn me to hell and send me in the other direction or whatever. And I'm just like, what kind of God is that? You know, <laughs> right. uh, no, no, that was all made up by man to keep people in fear, which will, if you're in fear, then you can be controlled. And that's right. what it's all about, which is what you were just talking about. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and coming out of that fear is scary because it's, it's, um, it can kind of hide away in it to a certain degree. Yes, for but sure. But it's not 
it's not doing anybody any good to do that. It's like living large, stepping into who you were called to be and what um, piece of this puzzle of this beautiful uh, eternity we have that you're playing right now. Which piece are you filling in? Well, isn't it funny that your father wanted you and your mother wanted you to preach about this and um, you've ended up all these years <laughs> later kind of being not a preacher, but like you're here with a message that people really need to hear. It's just a different kind of message. <laughs> so I yeah. think it's. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it is kind of <laughs> ironic. Um, but I just, you know, I'm just so delighted and so grateful and so blessed that I have a second, third chance because there was a point where I didn't, you know, I was so depressed. I never thought I would feel better. And, you know, and when you're in pain, I don't care who's telling you what, none of that matters. And people have to understand that you can't, when someone is in pain, they're just focused on the pain. Don't try to come at them with all this, uh, you're going to be fine. Don't do this, you know, whatever it is, you know, it is just, let it, you know, support them with that, hold their hand, be there for them, but don't try to discount that they can't focus on anything but that pain at that time. Right. Well, Nicole, this has been such a fascinating um, <laughs> and a really magical conversation of so many different topics that we discussed. Um, so if somebody wants to buy your book, but but do you work with people like one-on-one -on -one or do you you know, I've taken a I have taken a hiatus from that. Okay. Um, the book came out in August and I'm delighted to say it's already a bestseller. Oh um, my gosh, congratulations. I, I know, I know. So I am just, um, I, I I think the un God, the universe, whatever, uh, had my marketing plan all created 40 years ago, you know, and I'm just now stepping into it and the right people are showing up and the right influencers or whatever. And I'm just, I love talking and meeting people like you. And it's just such a high for me. And um, writing this book took me 13 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Writing it helped heal me, but you will see it's on, on Amazon. It's on Barnes and Noble. It's at independent bookstores, but I just want to show the audience just that was the car. Holy cow. Wow. That was the passenger side. And, um, yeah, it's unsurvivable. And then I wanted to always be on the front page of the paper. Well, here I did. I made it. Oh my gosh. So that is me that they are working on. Well, oh my gosh. Yeah. And then so, that picture is how many weeks into that? Uh, four weeks mm, after the crash, you know? Um, wow. And I had 10 different IVs going. I had 64 pints of blood transfused. I mean, I, and that was a time, if you remember, they were not screening for AIDS oh. and in, in blood test in 83. Yeah, yeah. And I remember uh, when I got well and they sent me home, they told me I need to go get an AIDS test. And I was like, you talk about fear, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> the yeah. odds of me getting it after that many transfusions. Um, but thank God I did not have it. Mm -hmm. And I remember a congressman from Colorado, his daughter was in a car crash. She had one pint of blood transfused and it was contaminated with AIDS and she passed away. Oh, so you just, you never know. And that's the thing about death is we don't, none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. And we need to keep that in mind and live each day in the present fully and talk about these things with our family and our friends. So they don't stay hidden and thinking, oh, I'm the only one that fears that because when it does get out in the open, then you're aware of it and it takes the sting out of it. Yeah. Well, where can someone go to find your book? I mean, I'll put the Amazon links and everything in the description of this podcast and this YouTube video, but do you also have a website? And if so, what is it? It's www.nicolekerr.com. I just redid it. And um, uh, you can write me there if you want a free first chapter, get on my email mailing list. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. Nicole Angelique Kerr. Um, and I'm on LinkedIn. And honestly, those are the only three I can keep up with because yeah. I'm a solo, <laughs> a solo practitioner here. And uh, I, it's just too much to keep all that other stuff running. So those are the ones I'm on. So okay. join me there. And, um, you know, I will keep you updated. Um, 
with what's going on. But people are already like, are you going to write another book? I said, are you kidding me? Do you know what it takes to write a book? Especially, <laughs> a yeah, from the heart and to be authentic and to, you know, uh, put your truth out there when it doesn't uh, align, especially with your family. I said, you know, it's it's not, it wasn't an easy process. So I said, let's just get this message out there first. <laughs> Well, I will put the links to all of your social media platforms and everything in the descriptions for this podcast and the YouTube video so people can find you and go and check you out and get that book. Thank you so very much for joining us on Life Magnetics Podcast. I've had such a great time. This was a really wonderful Aww, conversation and I'm, I'm super I grateful. Too. Me you. too. Blessings to you. Thank you.